Hi, this is Paul, and this is Rough Draft for Sunday, where I run through the current version of my Sunday sermon. Individualism. It's a cultural aspect that makes us ask questions first of the individual, and sometimes when combined with self-centeredness, means just me. In a, in a recent conversation that John Verveke had with Ian McGillchrist, um, John was talking about his term, the meaning crisis, and shared a little question that he would use with students sometimes. What would you want to continue to exist even, exist even after you weren't here? Now, I think for, the sermon is intended for people in my church, um, most of whom are Christians, but many Christians don't have a difficult time with that because they believe themselves participating at one level or another in a great endeavor, a great movement called the kingdom of God that has been um, going on for a very, very long time. And they understand their participation in church, their participation in family life, their participation in society, all as part of that kingdom of God. But in an individualistic society, many people don't sort of come with that naturally. Now, over the last number of sermons, I've shared sort of these two strategies of getting through life. One is to win, and of course to win, to be born to the right people at the right time in the right place is a huge advantage, but to, to work hard and to watch your addictions and to don't get sick and to use your brain and get educated and take care of your body and to try and gain wisdom, these are all good things to win as an individual and usually our our metrics for assessing whether or not we are winning as an individual has to do maybe with the money that we're having or the goals that we're making or all of these things. The other path is is escape, and that's often a religious path, and sometimes it's an individual religious path, a hope of heaven for a Christian, or escape the cycle of rebirth as an individual, and perhaps in a Hinduistic religion, or or resisting attachment in Buddhism, and of course modern paths are, are quite individual, entertainment or hobby or drugs. Now, individualized religion, individualized nature religions are all about me getting what I want and getting success, looking for hidden knowledge for success or seeking the power to conquer or prevail, uh, seeking the wisdom to navigate the complexities of this world and, and to achieve our own goals. Of course, there's sort of escape religion, assuming that the world is perhaps illusory or nonsensical or just simply the product of chaos. Well, um, how do we how do we get through it then? Maybe we impose an order on it that isn't there. And when people say your order is fictitious, we say, oh, I don't care. It works for me. Um, but the religions deliver strategies to distract or escape. Um, go to a place where there is order, escape whatever manifestation of being that is distressful or undesirable to you. But in the last number of years, I think we've had sort of shocking moments where we find ourselves moved in a way that we didn't think we would be moved. A few years ago when the cathedral at Notre Dame caught fire, whether or not people had actually used the place for a church service suddenly for the nation of France, this is, this is part of our heritage. Well, isn't it just a building um, like many other buildings that in Europe are not used or abandoned by people who actually want to do things like worship God, what do you care if it burns down? People all over the world cared. Also recently with the, with the death of Queen Elizabeth II. I, it's, it's amazing how many people are interested in this and watching it and, and all of this costly pageantry and finery and and suddenly this isn't this isn't just another funeral it grips us and 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 we're not exactly sure why now a few weeks ago we talked about the logos of the cross of Christ now this word logos you'll you'll find it in the word logic often your English translations will translate it word or message, but it's it's quite a bit deeper word. Um, a lo your logos is sort of an interpretive thread that takes multiplicity and gives it a rational order and a pathway to pursue. There's a logic behind the cross of Christ. And of course, for the Romans, the logic behind the cross was clear. You crucify slaves and you crucify revolutionaries to make an example of them before anyone, that if you cross the path of the, if you cross the the power of Rome, we will get you worse than you got us. That was the logic of the cross. 
But Jesus changes that logic from there forward, and not just sort of in a theoretical sense, but in the sense that now you can find millions, even billions of people walking around with little crosses around their neck or crosses on their building or crosses all over the place. The red cross means something very different than, well, these are how communists are going to persecute and crucify their enemies. The red cross means nothing like that. The red cross means something radically different because 2,000 years ago, Jesus was hung on a Roman cross and Jesus, by virtue of his spirit, changed through world history what that cross means. That is a historical fact that is absolutely incontestable today, no matter how you look at it. 1 Corinthians 1.18, the thesis statement of the book of 1 Corinthians, Paul says, The logos of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. The true logos of the cross, renewed by Jesus. But to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. And Paul will spend the rest of his time in the book of 1 Corinthians trying to show them the difference between these worlds. Now, I didn't get a chance to preach last week, so I'm going to include some of the text that's from last week and roll it into chapter 3 this week. And well, it's all part of the same sermon and letter that Paul is preaching, and so it will all, in fact, flow together. Paul says, We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, we declare God's wisdom, a mystery that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, or they would have, um, if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. If you read a book like Dynasty, you can get a real sense of, well, the logos of the cross, the wisdom of the world, what was thought to be wisdom and maturity that was on display in the Roman world, what everyone assumed was good, right, and true. You can find it in the lives of the first families of the Roman Empire, of the Julian-Claudian dynasty. When we read it today, we're horrified. But this was what success looked like. This was wisdom. This was how you rule the world. And the people of the Corinthian church were participating and operating within that moral and imaginal economy. And Paul says... The economy that you're playing in is not wisdom at all because it's not the wisdom of God. Well, how is the wisdom of God seen? Well, there is something that's revealed in the logos of the cross that, is already, that has always been, and it's been there in plain sight, but nobody ever bothered to notice it. It was not clearly understood by the rulers of the world because if they in fact wanted success, they would have worked differently. But... They were on display for everyone in the world to see. This is what we speak, not words taught to us of human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual realities with Spirit-taught words. The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that comes from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolish and cannot understand them because they are discerning only, discerned only through the Spirit. Now that sounds very spiritual, sounds very immaterial, but you can really see it in the concrete if, again, you look at the cross of Christ and you think about how Jesus changed the spiritual nature of human culture from the time of his crucifixion on through now in very tangible, real ways. Someone today parading the kind of morality that you find in the dynasty of the Julian-Claudian emperors would be considered horrendous today. Jesus changed even the moral assumptions of almost everyone in the world, whether or not they would call themselves a Christian, whether or not they would call themselves, um, um, they recognize that they've been changed by Christianity. They just imagine what they are doing is what it means to be a good person. The cross itself will not become a symbol for Christians for centuries, even after Jesus' crucifixion. It will take time for that Roman logos of the cross to recede, but it will, and it did. In the Gospel of John, um, Jesus um, in John, 
Remember when Jesus said he must go for his spirit to come? That's what he's talking about. His spirit came and his spirit has been remaking the world since. Um, This practice of your well-being at my expense seems utterly counterintuitive if your religion is about getting from zero to 100 with the most power, the best experiences, and the most success as an individual, as it is for many people in the world today. Children, having children, well, that's just silly. Why would anyone want children? They cost all this money. They cost all this time. Makes no sense to me. I don't want children. I want to live my best life now, and I don't want some kid interrupting it. That's the wisdom of the world. The person with the spirit makes judgments about all things, but such a person is not subject to merely human judgments for... Who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? Now, Paul takes a quote from Isaiah 40. Who has measured the waters of the hollow of his hand, or with the breath of his hand marked off the heavens? Who has held the dust of the earth in a basket, or weighed the mountains on the scales and the hills in a balance? Who can fathom the spirit of the Lord, the ruach of the Lord, or instruct the Lord in his counsel. Paul takes this quotation and changes the word from spirit to mind. This is the mind of Christ. And so then he concludes this section, but we must have the mind of Christ. Well, what is the mind of Christ? One of the best Pauline descriptions of the mind of Christ can be found in Philippians 2 in the Christ song. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a slave, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. So Paul continues now in chapter 3. Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, because they're not living by the Spirit, they're living by the Spirit of the Julian Claudians, and they're competing with each other but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. He's not saying they're outside of Christ. He's just saying, just like a little child, well, you might have the most mature, godlike parents, and their two-year-olds are scrapping over toys in the nursery. And that's exactly what Paul says of them, even while they consider themselves to be the mature, the arrived, because they're well-educated and they seem to be doing well in the eyes of themselves and perhaps in comparison to a few of their carefully chosen neighbors. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you are not ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly. You look like the Julian Claudians. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Well, what does that mean? Well, they've got sharp elbows. They're trying to, they're trying to pitch their way to the top of their little, of their little pyramids, and they want to lord it over each other. And Paul says, that's exactly opposite of the logos of the cross of Christ. You are acting like mere humans. You're acting like the Roman emperor and his whole royal family. For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not mere humans? What, after all, is Apollos, and what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted a seed, Apollo watered it, but God has made it to grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters has one purpose, and they will each be rewarded according to their labor. For we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. Now, what is coming here are two images, and we've already seen sort of the image of the, of the, the, the seed that gets planted and the water and making it grow. But now, again, pay attention. The person who puts the seed in the ground doesn't make it grow. The person who adds water doesn't make it grow. It grows of its own, 
or it grows by the will of God. But these two big images that we're giving that we're given here is that of a field and then a little bit later a temple. Now, these are both one and many images. What do I mean by that? Well, a field is made up of individual plants, but you see it as a whole. You know, the forest for the trees, the fields for the stalks. That the vision is for the field. Now notice, for we are co-laborers in God's service. You are God's field. You might say, well, I might be a plant in the field. Yes, you are. You're a plant in the field, but fields are made up of plants. And you of what God is looking for is a field. It's much bigger than you. It goes way beyond you. Now he's taken this at one level, talking about Paul and Apollos. They have roles to play in the field. The field is what God is looking for. Now the same thing we'll have with a building, God's building. We say, well, what's God's building? Well, that's a temple. Um, like a field, a building is made up of all these individual pieces, stones, wood, um, different laborers, some people to haul the stones, some people to haul the wood and to cut the wood and to, and to shape the stones and to put the stones on top of each other and design. A field is a collaborative effort of many people to achieve a harvest. A building is a collaborative effort of many people to achieve a building. And both of them also take time to complete. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care. For no one can lay a foundation other than the one that's already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their, will, their work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. For what has been built survives, the, if what has been built survives, the builder receives a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though only one, um, even though only as one escaping through the flames. Now, Paul is elaborating on his building metaphor that he's working here. You have a multiplicity of efforts and you have a multiplicity of skills, but you have one communal over long periods of time goals. And all of the individuals who participate in that participate in the meaning of the one overall communal goal. This is not individualism. Each building is tested. It's tested by the elements. It's tested by war. It's tested by change. One of the things that I noted when I was in Europe is that if you want something to last, build it beautiful. Why? Because successive generations will look at it and decide, we want to keep this. If you build something ugly, successive generations will say, this is in the way. It doesn't suit our needs. We're going to tear it down and we're going to build new. This is part of the reason that Europe is so full of old, beautiful buildings because its builders had the wisdom to build beautifully and for that reason, their buildings were kept and valued and desired. Now, you'll notice here in the middle of this, there's a reference to the day. And you'll notice that in the NIV, the day is capitalized. Well, why is that? I should probably highlight it in the text. The day is the day of the Lord. This theme from the Old Testament that Paul actually refers to a lot. Paul is extremely apocalyptic in his vision of what the church is about to face. And he'll be right. Because the church beyond Paul will be persecuted. Paul himself will be um, will be executed by Nero, the Julian Claudian, as will Peter, and many will suffer persecution. They will all suffer testing. And what Paul says is the thing that we communally build together will be tested. It will be tested in a whole bunch of different ways. Now, this day of the Lord is something which is both definitive, it's always imagined as an ultimate judgment day or the last day or the apocalypse, as we have tended to call it in, in, a Christian, in a Christendom context. But the day of the Lord comes in all kinds of little ways as well. We are all tested one way or another. And when we are tested, we are revealed to be, well, who we actually are. And Paul is saying, all of you are building and collaborating in this building. 
Now, some of you may be contributing stone, some of you may be contributing wood, some of you may be contributing straw, and when that day finally comes that your work will be tested, everyone will see how well you've built. Um, this is an intervention. This is an intervention of the catastrophic, which is apocalyptic, which means it's revealing, and Paul is saying, well, if you're building in worldly ways, you'll get pretty much what the Roman emperors get. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and God's spirit dwells in your midst? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is sacred and you together are that temple. Now this is a pretty amazing thing to say about more than a decade before the temple in Jerusalem will be destroyed. What we're beginning to see is that there's already a transition underway of, well, it's actually a part of a much longer transition, where this, the temple of stone gets replaced by human community. We saw a wave of that in the destruction of the first temple, the uh, Solomon's temple and the Babylonian captivity. After that, it began to launch the synagogue movements. And while, in fact, the temple would be rebuilt, and that second temple would survive all the way until 70 AD when the Romans destroyed it, the questions were, well, what do you mean you are a temple? Well, what is the temple? The temple is God's building. It's God's house. And if you read in the Old Testament, after Solomon constructed the temple, God's spirit came in the cloud, in this bright, shiny cloud, and drove everybody out of the temple. And that was the bearing witness of God's presence in the temple. Now, Paul is saying to the church, you are the temple. You, the church, not a temple built with stones. You can read in, for example, in 1 Peter 2, living stones, where we get the name of the, of the building, of the name of, the, of this particular congregation, that, well, you yourselves are a temple because God's spirit dwells in you. Now, what is a temple? Well, a temple is obviously a place of worship. It's a place where the deity dwells, but it's also a microcosm of the entire cosmos. You can see this in the tabernacle, descriptions of the tabernacle and instructions for the tabernacle, and you can see it in the temple. The temple is supposed to be a microcosm of the entire cosmos. And Paul is, in a sense, saying to the people, you as a community are a microcosm of the entire cosmos. What works in the large must work in the small, and what works in the small will work in the large. And so you yourselves are going to be that temple, but the quality of this construction, which you are now bringing to the place of construction, will be tested by fire. Will your church survive? Will your movement endure? God himself will protect the movement. Now, that might sound strange because in the Old Testament, the Babylonians come in and they destroy the temple. Were the Babylonians judged? Ask the Persians. Now, the Romans will come and destroy the temple. Will the Romans be judged? Ask the Italians. But yet at the same time, what we've seen throughout history is sort of the transformation the new temple in Jerusalem has not yet been built. There's a mosque that sits on the top of the Temple Mound. Now, of course, the Muslims will make a big deal about that mosque as its replacement of the temple. But the mosque is not actually what a temple is. What Paul says is that the microcosm of the universe, the presence of God, the way of living God's way needs to indwell and find shape and form in the church. And God himself will both call it to account, will call those who destroy it to account, and will protect it. But he will also test it. We saw that in the previous. The day of the Lord will come, and however well that church has been built will be seen in terms of how well it stands up to that day. Do not deceive yourselves. If anyone, any of you think you are wise by the standards of this age, look at the Julian Claudians, you should become fools so that you may become wise. Is Nero going to crucify himself or allow himself to be crucified? Never. 
For the wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight. Again, this is this theme that Paul has been weaving through these, these couple of chapters. As it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows what the thoughts of that the wise are foolish. So then, no one boasting, um, no more boasting about human leaders. All of these things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future. All are yours and you are of Christ and Christ is of God. So what Paul is saying here is that you shouldn't boast about the person who dragged the stone or the person who dressed the stone or the person who designed the, designed the arches or the person who designed the building or the person who sowed or the person who watered or the person who weeded. The goal is the field. The goal is the temple. The goal is the presence of God in the midst of the world that is battle-tested and can, in fact, survive. Now, the way that this addresses the meaning crisis is that, well, we have a project that is, in fact, centuries and centuries long. In one of the recent videos with, a, with an individual named Douglas Murray, um, he wonders. He's a, he's, a, he's a man in the UK who deconverted from Christianity, but he looks and he says, is Christianity a spent force? Can Christianity continue to rejuvenate a civilization and a culture? The building isn't just a building. These buildings that took hundreds of years and thousands of people, in fact, are national treasures. When it burned... We paid attention. Something is going on. Can we understand it? Can I, even I, imagine myself as participating in something far larger? A field, God's building, a civilization, something that endures the test of time and is battle-tested and will, in fact, offer wisdom and flourishing to future generations? Douglas Murray is struggling with Christianity. He wants to believe, but there's a number of things that are standing in his way. There is so little in our secular society, he notes, that is offering people to work towards beyond their own well-being. Okay, maybe you succeed at getting rich. Then you've got money. Maybe you succeed at building a nice business. How long will it last? People want to participate in the future. They want to feel that their sacrifices have meaning. They want to feel that even after they're dead and gone, the work of their hands will in fact contribute to something far larger beyond themselves. In a field, you might have successive waves of individual plants, but the field continues to bless the world. Each little stone has its own place, but all of those stones are critical for the cathedral to bless the world and inspire it by its beauty. Christianity offered a vision of the future as a participatory collective, a field, a temple. And this meaning crisis is the result of people having little to strive for beyond themselves. Now, the logos of the cross of Christ shows the way. And this is what Paul is teaching to them in Corinth. All of their competition with each other makes no sense. What they have to do, in fact, is work together. But it seems like foolishness to the people of the world, as it seemed on the day that Jesus was crucified. How is that a way to win the world? But in fact, for the last 2,000 years, we have seen it. In fact, it's a pattern that we can see all over the place. You can see it symbolically in many places and has always been here. Every good mother sacrifices her life for the future of her children. Every good father sacrifices his life for the future of his family. And all of that sacrifice is deeply meaningful because it envisions something that can go into the future and can never be lost. Every good generation sacrifices its short-term benefits for future generation. You don't think those medievalists had something they wanted to do more than sacrificing all of their time and money to build the cathedral? They clearly saw that as at least as important as bringing in the crops from the field. And they had far fewer margins than we have. It's building into our culture. 
and has for a very long time, into our traditions. All of this started with the man upon the cross who changed the logos of the Roman cross into his own. His spirit has been moving through time. It's embedded in cultural traditions that we see around us but don't even recognize as religious. But there they are, and we stop, and we look, and we should pause and note ourselves stopping and looking and say, hmm, what's in us that we don't even recognize deep within ourselves? The question is, what will you do? What field that you will never harvest will you contribute to? What cathedral that you will, or will never witness its completion will you put your labors towards? Do you see Christ's kingdom as a temple, as a field that you can participate in? Do you participate in it? Do you see your life as something that has significance far beyond what this earthly record might bear witness to? This is the meaning and the goal and the glory of so much of the Christian life. And the question is, will you too participate?